When examining the extensive repertoire of the musical theater luminary Stephen Sondheim, his body of work can be delineated into four distinct periods. The initial period, which I label as the cutting of the teeth period, spans from the 1950s up until approximately a funny thing that happened on the way to the forum. During this phase, Sondheim primarily collaborated with others, often serving as a lyricist. Notable productions from this era include West Side Story, Gypsy, and his less successful endeavor, Anyone Can Whistle. Additionally, this period encompasses his contributions to university productions and other minor successes like Do I Hear a Waltz and Evening Primrose. During this early phase, Sondheim's distinctive style had yet to fully emerge. While elements of his syncopated rhythms can be detected, they are not yet pervasive. Although glimpses of them can be found in songs such as Everybody Says Don't from Anyone Can Whistle. Furthermore, traces of major influences from figures like Oscar Hammerstein II and Milton Babbitt are discernible. Babbitt, although considered by some to have a negative impact on 20th century music and, by extension, musical theatre, paradoxically contributed to inspiring Sondheim's more avant-garde inclinations as Sondheim drew upon some of Babbitt's eccentricities. In 1970, Sondheim's second era of work commences, which I designate as his golden era. This phase marks the onset of his collaboration with Hal Prince, and it is within this period that his most exceptional work is concentrated. The avant-garde themes previously inspired by Babbitt now manifest in the experimental sounds emblematic of 1970s genius. Notable productions from this era include Company, Follies, A Little Night Music, Pacific Overtures, and Sweeney Todd, culminating with the less than successful yet musically remarkable Merrily We Roll Along. During this period, Sondheim's artistic vision reached its full potential, yielding his most exceptional work. Traditional molds were shattered as drama reached heightened levels, resulting in the creation of some truly remarkable theater. While I will delve deeper into this period in a future installment, this video will not cover it extensively. The third era commences in the early 1980s, as Sondheim joins forces with James Lapine in collaboration. I refer to this period as the overwritten period, some of Sondheim's most ambitious work is conceived and brought to the stage during this time. Notably, Sondheim and Lapine achieve acclaim, including a Pulitzer Prize for Sunday in the Park with George, which stands as one of Sondheim's most ambitious endeavors, marking a pinnacle in his artistic career. However, as is often the case with artists who are hailed as infallible, there is a tendency to forego rigorous editing resulting in works that may lack the impact of their earlier creations. In today's video, we will explore the prologue or opening from Into the Woods, a production that, in my view, exemplifies one of the most overwritten shows in the musical theater canon, yet features one of the most compelling opening numbers in said canon. The overwritten period also encompasses works such as Passion and the non-Lapine creation, Assassins. The last era of Sondheim's career commences in the 1990s and extends until his passing. This phase is termed the retrospective period, characterized by the compilation of his earlier works into reviews and the development of new productions based on his pre-existing material. Notably, this period includes projects such as the perpetually evolving Wise Guys also known as Bounce or Roadshow, which underwent multiple iterations. Additionally, there are a few other works that never quite achieved widespread recognition or acclaim. However, as mentioned earlier, the focus of this video remains on the analysis of the opening number of Into the Woods. In my inaugural video on opening numbers, I underscored the importance of incorporating three fundamental elements to craft a compelling beginning. Firstly, establishing the setting and context of the narrative. Secondly, 
introducing the central themes that will permeate the musical, and thirdly, presenting the primary conflict or question that will propel the storyline and necessitate resolution by the conclusion of the production. In the first act of Into the Woods, we witness a realistic parody of grim fairy tales intertwined with elements of Mother Goose. The characters include Cinderella, Jack and the Beanstalk, the Baker's Wife, a malevolent witch, and Rapunzel, along with occasional appearances, depending on the production, of three blind mice and the three little pigs. Prior to this production, many musicals had explored these European fairy tales and their potential appeal to audiences. For instance, Once Upon a Mattress in the 1960s adeptly parodied them, contributing to Carol Burnett's rise to prominence. Additionally, annual community musicals in the form of pantomimes in the UK and Christmas pageants in North America frequently incorporated these tales to great effect. However, Into the Woods, crafted by Sondheim and Lapine, endeavors to reinterpret these stories through a lens of realism and New York dramatic sensibility. While some critics argue that the show ages up the tales, I contest this notion. Fairy tales, in essence, are not inherently childish. They are akin to collective campfire narratives, much like Greek myths or Chinese folk tales. This is where the confusion about the show may originate. Some viewers may perceive Into the Woods as an attempt to modernize old stories. Personally, I find this concept disagreeable, but we will revisit it shortly. The entirety of the show revolves around a literal narrator, a godlike figure who guides the audience through the actions, destinations, and motivations of the characters. The narrator's presence extends both within and outside the play, wielding significant influence, particularly in the first act, where his baritone voice assumes a central role. The prologue is constructed around this concept, swiftly introducing the core characters as they navigate the outset of their journeys. We encounter Cinderella, besieged by her stepmother and stepsisters, Jack and his mother, existing in a state of childhood innocence, oblivious to the complexities of adulthood, and Little Red Riding Hood embarking on her journey to her grandmother's house. Most importantly, we are introduced to the baker and his wife, who form the crux of Into the Woods, encapsulating its essence. The prologue, or sometimes called opening of Into the Woods, succinctly and sometimes bluntly introduces each character, with the narrator providing a call-out, followed by brief scenes depicting each character in their initial state. This sequence culminates in the characters venturing into the mystical and foreboding woods, symbolizing the journey into adulthood. Throughout the show, this metaphor is continuously reinforced through semi-poetic language and direct statements, leading up to the Act 1 finale. While the woods initially represent a natural transition to adventure and discovery in the prologue, they also serve as a backdrop for fraud, sexuality, and manipulation as the narrative progresses. Overall, this prologue stands as one of the finest examples of world-building and character establishment in musical theatre. It demonstrates the effectiveness of opening a show with extreme clarity and directness. Sondheim frequently employs this approach in his best works, recognizing its efficiency in laying the foundation for the narrative. Luckily, the original cast and production were recorded for posterity. I'll be utilizing clips from this throughout the further discussion. The second essential characteristic of a strong opening number lies in its ability to establish central themes of the forthcoming musical and dramatic narrative. Sondheim's adeptness at motivic development is evident throughout his repertoire, spanning from his acclaimed Golden Age productions to those considered more excessive. The prologue achieves this in several ways. It commences with the narrator addressing the audience with the timeless invocation of a fairy tale, Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time. Following this, A striking C major 7 chord resonates, characterized by its consistent quarter note progression. This rhythmic motif persists throughout the entirety of the 14-minute piece, serving as a musical thread interwoven with entrances and exits of various characters. 
The music within my mind embodies two distinct traits. It possesses a deceptive simplicity, reminiscent of folk melodies, yet simultaneously exudes a mechanical quality. This mechanized rhythm permeates the entirety of Into the Woods. I've often pondered why a musical centered around familiar fairy tales would adopt such an industrial rhythm. The answer lies in the thematic core of the show. The transition from childhood to adulthood. It symbolizes the shift from pastoral innocence of youth to the corrupted mechanistic mindset of adulthood. The prologue evokes parallels with the opening lines of Wallace Shawn's My Dinner with Andre, where the narrator reflects on the evolution from youthful contemplation of music and art to a preoccupation with money. This thematic trajectory underpins the essence of the show. Once upon a time, I wish in a far-off kingdom, more than any lived a fair maiden, more than life, a sad young lad, more than you, I wish, and a childless baker, more than life, I wish, with his wife, more than anything, more than the moon, I wish the king is... Aside from its exploration of the corruption of childhood innocence into the cynicism of adulthood, the theme of Into the Woods revolves around the yearning for the unattainable. It delves into the human tendency to desire something other than what one possesses, essentially an addiction to overlooking the power of living in the present moment. Hey, little girl. I wish. Throughout the prologue, we are confronted with a recurring refrain. I wish. This refrain remains open-ended. While some characters express their current desires, their wishes are subject to change in the future. Even the conclusion of the whole musical, after two acts, concludes with an unresolved I wish. With the establishment of the theme and the construction of the world and into the woods, ably done, Attention naturally turns to the introduction of the antagonist, or central conflict, or question. In a Sondheim musical from this overwritten period, such as this, there are often multiple conflicts and antagonists. However, in this song we encounter two of them, with the primary antagonist being the witch. The witch, in fact, has her own song within the larger prologue, which can be described more as a rap. More than anything in the world was greens, greens, and nothing but greens. Parsley, peppers, cabbages, and celery, asparagus, and watercress, and vinegars, and lettuce. He said, all right, but it wasn't quite, because I caught him in the autumn in my garden one night. He was robbing me, raving me, rooting through my rutabaga, raiding my arugula, and ripping up the rampy and my champion, and my favorite. I should have laid a spell on him right there. Ah. Here, we witness her manipulation of the baker's family line and her arbitrary initiation of the quest they are to embark upon. The quality of this moment has always left me uncertain. It's quite literally a rap song, complete with electric drums. The peculiarity of this scene is embraced wonderfully by the original witch, Bernadette Peters, but I've observed other productions that seem equally perplexed by this moment some that drift into parody of rap, some that drift into absurdity of rap. And it shows that many other directors have been as confused about this as myself. I believe Sondheim's inclusion of this modern, somewhat out-of-place music serves to underscore both the significance of the witch's directive as a catalyst and the broader metatheatrical importance of her character a significance that becomes increasingly apparent as the show unfolds. It's a not-so-subtle hint that this character, the witch, stands apart from the others. This discussion has extended beyond the usual length that I like to do for these videos, yet it feels like I've merely skimmed the surface of this song. Its complexity is such that only a meticulous analysis dissecting the it beat by beat would truly suffice. However, I won't subject you to that level of detail in this video. You can comment if you would be interested in something like that. What becomes apparent from examining this incredibly intricate opening number 
is the paramount importance of world building. The integration of thematic elements into both the musical composition and dramatic narrative, and the necessity of a compelling introduction to the antagonistic forces or conflicts within the piece. Each of these aspects is not only clearly present, but also masterfully executed in this opening number, which is why I've chosen to include it as the ninth entry on the list of the greatest opening numbers in musical theatre. <laughs> 